Hi everyone, this is Mark Lox, Extension Weed Scientist at The Ohio State University, coming to you at the CTIC. This is the first of two talks, and I'll be talking in this half hour about herbicide management and non-GMO corn and soybeans. Just to remind you, as we get started, we do have some resources for you. We have the new weed control guide, which was in revised, and you can uh, get at the Extension e-store. You can get a hard copy and a PDF together, or you can just get the PDF for a little cheaper. We also have on our website a uh, fact sheet. This is also an Ohio line, a fact sheet on herbicide programs for non-GMO soybeans, which we updated uh, just recently. So that's available for you. And I'm basically um, spending most of my time talking about soybeans here. And this is coming uh, really right off of this fact sheet, which covers everything I think you pretty much need to know. Uh, Non-GMO corn is really easy. So I have one slide on it. Um, you really essentially have the full complement of herbicides in non-GMO corn that you have in uh, transgenic corn. The only difference is you can't spray glyphosate or glufosinate posts, and you can't um, use the higher rates in the, in the Enlist Duo uh, and One products later in corn that you might be able to in an Enlist, in Enlist corn. But you have all the same broad-spectrum residual herbicides and a lot of very good premixes, and you can also make your own uh, mixes with generic ingredients because most of these products have are made up of generic components at this point. Um, if you don't want to do something that's a three or four way, you can do a two way atrazine premix. And if you're planning to do a pre followed by a post, that might be your way to shave your cost a little bit up front. Uh, we do have people that get away with total pre in corn, so it doesn't really matter what kind of corn you have, um, that'll work. Your, your exceptions there are giant ragweed's really a, a weed that requires a post application. Um, a lot of the time, unless you just don't have very much of it, water hemp can come through about anything, late grass emergence. And then if you get into vines, morning glory, any perennials, things like that, you're really going to have to have a post option. And you do have um, not quite as effective post options as you would um, in a transgenic corn, probably. Uh, you can look in the weed control guide and see all the different post approaches you could take. But I mean, some of the common ones here for broadleaf control would be status, also Diflex, which is dicamba safe and also uh, mesotrione. Um, and mesotron in a lot of cases goes with atrazine. If you get into a broadleaf and grass situation, you still have a bunch of decent options. Lotus, Impact, Armazon, Shield X, which a lot of times go with atrazine to give them a little better better control of grasses and a few broadleaves. Caprino, and then a couple other uh, herbicides that have either rim sulfuron or nickel sulfuron and on the Revulon and Realm Q. So you have a lot of uh, good options, really. And I, I think over the years that I've talked to people doing non-GMO corn, weed control non-GMO corn has really not uh, been that much of an issue. When you get into non-GMO soybeans, you have four or five key weeds that are just really problematic um, and and really have to be dealt with the right way and can make or break you, I think, on non-GMO soybeans. Um, and there's a mare's tail, um, which is still a weed that shows up pretty commonly in our surveys. There's a lot of it around, even though we have uh, very good options. Uh, water hemp, which is increasing. Um, water hemp is probably the biggest weed that if you have significant water hemp, really reconsidering whether you can do non-GMO soybeans until you clean that up. Giant ragweed, which of course is ubiquitous pretty much across Ohio and is, is always an issue. And um, so far has not developed resistance to the one type of post herbicide PBO inhibitors that you can still use post for it in non-GMO soybeans, but we're kind of holding our breath on that. Um, and then common ragweed, which is uh, kind of interesting because there are a lot of people who don't have much common ragweed left based on the effectiveness of pre and post herbicides. And then we have areas uh, in Northwest Ohio comes to mind where we have uh, still a lot of common ragweed and it's developed multiple resistance. And so with certain types of resistance, you can really um, put a damper on your ability to, to do non-GMO soybeans. And that resistance looks like this. So um, we have uh, the ALS inhibitors. Uh, we have mer most of the Maristale populations are resistant to ALS, and that's like classic first-rate pursuit products like that. A lot of the giant ragweed is, a lot of the common ragweed is, and most of it is up in the northwestern part of the state, and essentially all the water hemp is ALS um, resistant. And then we have a lot of glyphosate resistance, which mainly affects burn down since you can't use glyphosate uh, post in non-GMO soybeans, but it affects burn down issues with Maristale and giant ragweed. And then PPO inhibitors, the Flexstar and Cobra, which are really important for non-GMO, they're not effective on mare's tail anyway. Um, and then we have 
uh, giant ragweed, which has not developed resistance yet, and I think that's partly because they're only so effective on it, so the selection pressure is not that high. You almost always have some tolerant ones escaping. There is some PPO resistant uh, common ragweed in the state, and there's a fair amount of PPO resistant water hemp. So it's kind of important to know where you sit um, with this. But you know, the the bottom line of this is. Um, if you have, we're assuming it's all ALS resistant, or most of these are, you have to make the assumption they are. And then if they aren't, they're going to become ALS resistant probably over the course of uh, producing non-GMO. So that's going to leave you with PPO inhibitors as your main post. And you really have to monitor whether you developed uh, resistance to those. And if you do for a couple of key weeds, you're basically out of the non-GMO business. And that's what I have here. You have the ramifications of herbicide resistance for non-GMO soybeans. So mare's tail, it means you have no post options. Um, so it has to be controlled with burn down plus residual herbicides, a combination of fall and spring burn down. Um, and you need to make sure you pick the right uh, residual combination or premix uh, to get control. And I'll cover that here in another slide. But that's typically mixing metribuzin with some flumioxazin or sulfentrazone or a product that has both of those in it. Uh, giant ragweed PPO is your only post option. And the mistake a lot of people make is trying to get by with one post application. On giant ragweed and fomesophen, which is Flexstar and all the generics and Cobra, are just really, they're only so good on giant ragweed, 80 to 85 percent at best. Uh, we've been able to control nasty populations with two applications. First application, fomesophen, followed by a second one of Cobra. But it, if you don't take that approach, I think you're really going to struggle. Uh, common ragweed gets a little bit more interesting because um, if we assume we have ALS resistance, your only residual products that you really have are flumioxazin, which is Valor which is fair to good, and then metribuzin, which is poor to fair. Um, and then if you still have activity from PPOs, you also have Femesifen or Flexstar and Cobra uh, as your post. And, and typically Femesifen is about 10 to 15% better than Cobra in a post application. Uh, once you do develop PPO resistance, which is always in conjunction with ALS resistance, you have no post options. And the only residual option you have would be metribuzin, which would be really not very good. So you're out of the non-GMO business at that point, unless you can drive those populations way down. Water hemp, it's the same situation. You have actually a lot of pre-herbicides that work on water hemp, more than you do, way more than you do for common ragweed uh, or mare's tail, really. Um, but your only PPO options are, your only post options are PPO of, again, Flexstar and Cobra, Flexstar being from Esfin being better than Cobra. And then once you have PPO resistance, you lose activity of your some of your residuals, but you're, you lose your post option. So you're out of the business. So we, I, I really think it's difficult to uh, recommend you growing non-GMO soybeans in a field that's infested with water hemp. So keeping the whole thing viable and preparing fields for non-GMO soybean success, I, you want to come into it with um, several prior years of effective weed control where you get good control and you drive the weed seed bank down. So you don't have anything that kind of gets out of control. You want to work on perennials, uh, you don't want to plant non-GMO in fields where weed control failures have happened and the seed bank is high, especially for some of those key weeds I just mentioned. Um, and you want to make sure that you're using, you know, corn herbicides and corn and then um, some of the new soybean herbicide trait systems and focus on the tough weeds to get those under control. And then once you're in a rotation, it's really the same thing. Our recommendation would be that you plant non-GMO soybeans. Um, about every fourth year. So you have a couple years of corn or some wheat in there, and then one year of a GMO, a traded soybean, um, to make sure you get control and, and minimize your selection for resistance. So when you come back to that um, fourth year and plant uh, non-GMO and you're using PPO inhibitors, again, post-emergence, that you still have those viable options of Flexstar and Cobra. You're trying to take the pressure off those so that they keep um, lasting and you don't just drive them into the ground and drive yourself out of the non-GMO business. Um, so you want to make sure you spend the money, make enough applications to get good weed control throughout the rotation so that, you know, when you hit that fourth year and plant non-GMO soybeans, uh, it works out well. And you have a lot of good options. Um, basically, the slide here is showing that in non-GMO and Roundup Ready, once we start to get into resistance issues, we start to lose control. We have variable control of some of these key weeds. But you have all these systems, Liberty Link, Liberty Link GT27, Extend, Extend Platform, and List which uh, when you do it the right way, really provides good to excellent control and um, can uh, make your life way easier uh, by the time you come back to non-GMO soybeans. So your steps, and these are right off the fact sheet, your steps for weed control non-GMO soybeans. We strongly recommend fall herbicide treatments. Almost everybody has some mare's tail, and mare's tail is just always an issue in a burn down. 
Um, you can get it in a burn down, but it's going to be a more aggressive program. You have more variability. And then if you don't get it in that spring burn down, it's going to come back and really cause problems. So a uh, strong uh, fall herbicide program, it doesn't have to cost a lot. We typically go with 2,4-D plus some glyphosate. Um, you can use dicamba with a 2,4-D or canopy or another ALS. An effective spring burn down, which if you didn't do a fall application, does have to be more aggressive. You need to make sure you're getting it on early enough to get everything when it's small and make sure it works. A comprehensive residual herbicide program. Um, and then coming back to uh, the first post when weeds are small. So, um, you know, we have several systems, especially the uh, Extend and the and the Enlist system, and also still the Roundup on the weeds that glyphosate still works on the Roundup Ready that, you know, we can spray some fairly large weeds. They may already be starting to reduce yield, but when we come back to using Flexstar and Cobra type materials, uh, we really need to make sure the weeds are small and then come back with a second post as needed, not try to let everything get big and get by with one application. I can't emphasize the, the value of the fall herbicide treatments enough. These photos are showing uh, really what any fall herbicide treatment does on the left. It doesn't have to have residual. That's pretty typical. You'll finally start to get some giant ragweed coming through it in April. And then towards the end of April or beginning of May, you can have some other summer annual weeds start to come through versus the one on the right, which is, uh, you know, not as maybe a, a little bit messier burn down situation that a lot of people have. But one of the problems with that situation is, uh, overwintered mare's tail, which are going to be difficult to control uh, in a non-GMO system. And also the fact that if you get rained down and it gets wet, it turns into a big mess and really gets even more difficult to control. So it's a matter of where you spend your money and a fall treatment's um, always a good idea and especially important for non-GMO soybeans. Dandelion's another weed that's making a recurrence. And when you uh, get away from extend and enlist systems and Roundup Ready and the ability to use some of those herbicides post, um, you really start to have some issues with dandelion, especially the ones that, that get a good foothold. So when they're fairly small, you may still get them with a burn down. Although you can see here, this is a June 18th photo with a lot of seedlings coming on in there that your post is not likely to control. Um, and then once you get a, a little bit past that and you've got the even bigger ones with a big tap root, um, you know, fall application is just the way to go. If you don't make fall application and interrupt the life cycle, then these are just going to be extremely difficult to control and cause big problems in non-GMO soybeans. So your spring burn down herbicide options. Um, if you've made a fall treatment, you can really do about anything. Uh, you can do glyphosate. You could almost do straight glyphosate in certain fields, but we would probably wouldn't recommend it. Um, you're going to have some small spring emerging mare's tail, possibly. You may have some dandelion that came through, um, some things like that. So glyphosate with 2,4-D, waiting seven days to plant. You can do glyphosate with one of the products that contains saflufenacil, sharp and verdict. Uh, Zidua Pro. You got the a very good option with Gramoxone 2,4-D, which does work better with Metribuzin. This time depends on how early in the spring you're spraying it and how messy it is, but you're going to need Metribuzin out there anyway for residual control, so you would say put it in. Same thing with Glufosinate. Uh, Glufosinate's a product that struggles in a spring burndown. If it's, if it's fairly messy, it likes warm weather and warm sunny weather, uh, but if you've done a fall application, there probably is a place for it. You got glyphosate plus 2,4-D you can do, and then glufosinate plus 2,4-D, which you can also add metribuzin to. And if you're just going to spray glufosinate without the 2,4-D, you definitely need the metribuzin. And then you could add glyphosate to that as well, which is in a situation where you haven't done a fall treatment, it's going to become more important. And so here, um, again, depending how big things are and how much mare's tail you have, you want to pull the stops out. We'd recommend glyphosate plus 2,4-D and a saflufenacil containing herbicide. Um, or glyphosate plus 2,4-D and glufosinate um, to try to get all those and make sure you get the mare's tail. You can still make gramoxone plus 2,4-D plus metribuzin work. You have higher rates of gramoxone you need here, and there will come a point where um, weeds get kind of big and this mix may struggle. And then if you're going to use glufo glufosinate any other way, you want to make sure you have 2,4-D and metribuzin in it or sharpen and, and metribuzin in it. And, and really, it's a little bit difficult to think about making those work, I think, without uh, some glyphosate in them as well. So residual herbicides, you have some different weeds to think about. If you have giant ragweed, you know, you're really going for something that has first trader classic in it or pursuit can help out. If you have ALS resistance, none of those are going to work and it pretty much puts it all back on the post-emergence program. Mare's tail, you can get it with the right combination of residuals. It's not bulletproof, but the most effective approach we've found is that the four herbicides that have some residual activity on mare's tail are metribuzin, 
Fumioxazin, which is valor, sulfentrazone, which is authority, and then sharpen at the higher rates, which have to go out uh, farther ahead of planning. But what our research typically shows is combinations are, are more consistently effective than any one product uh, based on the variability of herbicides and the fact that none of these are terribly long-lived herbicides, really. So our main recommendation is either a, a tank mix or a premix that contains decent rates of metribuzin, like a 0.38 pound rate of metribuzin. Um, with flumioxazin or sulfentrazone or high rate of metribuzin with Sharpen. And then you've got a bunch of uh, every year even more uh, premixes that include metribuzin with flumioxazin or sulfentrazone. I'll talk more about those here in a second. And uh, you can check the weed control guide for rates and ratings on those. When you come back to water hemp, it depends on what kind of resistance you have. You actually have a lot of products that give some upfront residual control. Of water hemp, we assume it's all ALS resistant, and so this is what you have. You have a pretty good range of options. We don't give anything a nine just because water hemp comes at you all season, so you, you know we expect we're going to have to spray it post-emergence. Uh, but the PPO inhibitors of flumioxazine and sulfentrazone, higher rates of metribuzin, pyroxysulfone, which is zidua, um, and then it wouldn't apply to non-GMO soybeans, but the isoxaflutol, which is Elite 27. Um, and then once you get down past that, you've got metallochlor, methymethenamide, which is Outlook, pendimethalin, which is Prow, and then a warrant, the acetochlor, and also linuron on really light soils. Uh, once you have PPO resistance, you don't completely lose activity of your flumioxazine or sulfentrazone, but you lose some activity and especially longevity of control. And so it drops them out of that top category into a seven or seven plus. And they could be lower than that, depending on the magnitude of the resistance. So you've got your better products, the high rates of metribuzin, pyroxysulfone at the top, the only two components you can use in non-GMO and then everything down else is down in the seven. Our assumption is you're either going to mix a couple of these or you're going to have a premix that includes a couple. So that may keep you up in the eight category. And then we haven't confirmed any here, but there is resistance to acetamides. Group 15 developing has developed further west, and we picked up some lack of response in some populations that we've screened in the greenhouse. And so that throws all the acetamides out. And the only product we give an 8 or 8 plus that you could use in non-GMO soybeans is metribuzin. And then you've got some other options down there below. So um, it are 7, 7 plus that you could mix with metribuzin. So you can see the ramifications of resistance here, obviously. Um, when we start to talk about residuals. And so when you're looking at the chart in the weed control guide, the residual chart, we have for a number of these weeds, we have specified different types of resistance. So if you look at the far left, you've got common ragweed, common ragweed that's ALS resistant, group two, and then common ragweed that's resistant to ALS and PPO, group two and 14. And we have the same thing um, for some of the other ones. So in non-GMO, when you're selecting, um, if you if you don't have PPO resistance, make sure you're at least selecting herbicides that are effective for group two resistant. And if you think you have group uh, 14 resistance, PPO resistance as well, make sure you're selecting out of that column. And you'll see when you move from that, those columns, like the three columns of giant common ragweed from left to right, you'll see you'll start to lose a lot of options um, based on having that multiple resistance. And just to kind of a couple other things to think about, we have the glossary in the back of the weed control guide, and we have, there are a ton of generic premixes now from different companies that are, and, it, and it's really a good thing. We have a lot of two and three way that finally got our rates of some of these products like metribuzin and flumioxazin in the premix up high enough in the sulfentra zone. So the caution here is that we list some of these by, tr by trade name in the descriptions and on the effectiveness table, and some of these by generic, the common uh, name. It depends on how many they are. So once we get more than a couple, we just list them by uh, the common names because that's really the fair way to do it for all the companies. So that's when you have to go to the glossary and see what the common name is and come back and look it up that way. Um, same thing on the table. Some of them we list by trade name um, and some by common uh, name if they have more than a couple. And you might think this is kind of a goofy way to do it, but um, it's the best way we've sort of evolved to doing that. And then the other thing you can use the other part of the guide is table 22 which not only shows you components, but it shows you the amount of the component in the mix. And then it, and then we give you a representative rate, which may not be your use rate for your soil type, but it shows you, uh, or your weed situation, but it shows you the rate of the common, uh, of the active ingredient that you get in there. So you can compare. And for example, if you look at the top three products, you can see they all have some sulfentrazone, but 
if that was a use rate, you could see that one had five ounces equivalent of self-interest zone 4L, one had 6.1, and one had four ounces. So something to kind of keep in mind as you're sorting through premixes and trying to keep your rates up so they're active, especially on a weed like mare's tail. And then the post approach that we suggest really is um, first post application, weeds less than four inches tall. The giant ragweed is typically going to be bigger because when you spray giant ragweed when it's four inches tall, nothing else is out of the ground. So you have to let giant ragweed essentially get more like four to ten. Don't let it get too big. Um, and typically we would pick Fomesafen or Flexstar or Generic plus, plus a grass herbicide, Select, Fusion, whatever you want to use in that first application. And that's because Fomesafen is across the board a little bit more effective than Cobra and Phoenix on most weeds. So you want to pull the trigger and use the Fomesafen first and save the Cobra for later. You can add First Rate or Classic to this, um, and that can broaden, broaden your spectrum, give you a little better control. Even of a weed like Common and Giant Ragweed, you may have some that are still uh, sensitive out there. And we've picked up, for example, in a population we were pretty sure was mostly ALS resistant, we've picked up a slight bump in control by doing that. And then coming back later, with if you need to, with a second post application to Cobra or Phoenix, Plus another grass herbicide if you need it. And for us, this is almost mandatory for giant ragweed. And for us, we just, uh, based on some research we did in some pretty high populations, we evolved to just marking the calendar and making the second application three weeks after the first. And it just always worked, regardless of what the giant ragweed was doing or what the beans were doing or whatever. Um, the other thing you can add to the post for water hemp um, is pyroxysulfone which is in various products, Zidua, Anthem Max, Anthem Flex, or Metallochlor, which is in Dual and all those products to give you an extended control of water hemp later in the season. This kind of depends on the uh, density of your water hemp and how late your post is going on. If your post goes on pretty late because your pre's worked really well, you may not need to do this, but this is something to consider. And we don't typically recommend the other acetamides in this control. Um, and just a couple of examples here. So here's an ALS-resistant giant ragweed population that was really dense by the time we got into it um, and worked with it. Results from 2008 and 2009. And the main point I want to make here is um, if you have very much giant ragweed, it's really difficult to figure out how to time it to have plants when they're small enough that the Flexstar or Cobra would actually control them um, and still... Um, uh, be late enough that you catch some of the late emergence. It's almost impossible. And the, no, the control numbers here from a single application of Flexstar, we had a different rate each year, reflect that. We had 20% control one year, 73% the second year. I think the population was a little lower the second. And then you can see if you go down to the Flexstar followed by Cobra, space three weeks apart, we're 83 to 100% control um, the first year. And bumping the Flexstar rate um, or bumping the Cobra rate, each one can can help you somewhat there. Um, and then in 2009, anything we did gave us 100% control with those two applications. Um, this was had a pre-application of Valor XLT on it, although the Clermion in there didn't give us any help on the on the giant ragweed. And the first post was on four to seven inch weed, so you can target four to eight inch giant ragweed, you know, something like that, and come back with the second one three weeks later. And that's because when you look at the giant ragweed emergence curve. This is an actual emergence curve from 2006, uh, Western Ohio, at the farm at South Charleston. Um, and it basically comes at you from late March all the way through early July. And so if you think about trying to get by with one post-emergence application, based on the fact that it grows three inches a day under good moisture and then keeps coming up into July, it's impossible to make that work. And if your pre-emergence herbicide gives you 70% control up front, which it can once in a while if you don't have too much ALS resistance, you know, that can push your post back late enough in some fields so you actually can make that work, although I would argue you're probably getting out of the window for a Flexstar or Cobra would actually completely control plants because they only do that if they're very small. This is probably more realistic, and our recommendation would be you just plan to do this for giant ragweed in a non-GMO soybean field where you're still going to use residual herbicides in a burn down, but you're going to come, to, come in with a first post when ragweed are four to eight inches and then come back with a second post three weeks later. And, and really, it works. There's some Tweaks you can make in terms of your Flexstar rate up front, which obviously varies depending on whether you're north or south of I-70. Um, and then, you know, whether you need a 12-ounce rate of Cobra on the other end, on the back end, you make it by with 8 to 10 ounces there. I think our research would show 6 ounces is a little bit low. So there's our information. Glad to be with you today.